Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today at the Rutgers Geology Museum for our Ask a Geologist web series. Today we have Dr. Luke Zut, and he is an assistant professor in the Department of Geoscience at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he will be talking to us about glacial landscapes. So without further ado, you can uh, go ahead and start. Thank you. Great, thanks Maria. I'm uh, really happy to be able to talk to you all about um, this really interesting thing that I find in the environment, which is basically how glaciers shape the world around us. Uh, some areas in particular, they've done more work than in other, other spots, but uh, their effects can be sort of felt globally, not just in the areas where glaciers are now or have been in the immediate past. Um, I guess this is the opening slide. This is, I kind of like this picture. Uh, this is a trip that I took in 2018, actually, with someone from the uh, Rutgers uh, Geology Museum. And we hiked up this giant valley in Switzerland, and we got up there, and this guy's actually playing this Alpen horn, which is one of these incredibly long horns. And the reason they do it in these glacial valleys is because the shape of the glacial valley is really distinct, and it causes the sound waves that he emits out of the horn to echo in a specific way in such a way where he's actually using the shape of the valley as part of the instrument. And it was somewhat also demoralizing because we're struggling extremely hard to get up there, carry all the stuff. And this guy's just bounding up the slope, carrying this alpine horn like it's uh, like it's like it's a Sunday walk, which for him it probably was, but for us it was it was a real trek. So um, not only do glaciers produce these beautiful landscapes, they also have something to do with like musical instruments that uh, they play in Switzerland in particular. So a little bit about me, uh, my name is Luke Zut. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, that's the uh, University of Wisconsin that's on a strip of land between two big lakes, which is where I'm coming to you from right now. Uh, that strip of land is called the Isthmus um, and I live on it. Uh, a little bit of background, I've been to Antarctica four times and when we go to Antarctica, uh, there's a lot of people that stay in a big base in Antarctica, and there's a smaller amount of people that stay in uh, little sort of tent bases that have maybe 50 people. And then there's a very small amount of people that go into what's called the deep field, which is maybe four or five people sleeping in a tent in the middle of uh, Antarctica, where the next closest person is the, the people in the space station going over your head. And that's where we go. We go to the deep field. And so we spend months at a time living in these tents with no heat or anything in the middle of Antarctica to understand how glaciers work. Um, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, um, I think I'm unmuted. I see one thing that came through, didn't hear anything, but Rhea, you can let me know if it's not working. Uh, a lot of the time we are spending there is to figure out how glaciers work, but underneath those glaciers is land. And the glaciers, as they're moving around over the land, they're shaping that land and eroding it away. And if the glaciers then melt because the climate warms or something, that all that land that's below them gets exposed, and we can see, um, and we can see these land forms and we can see this landscape that's left behind. <clears throat> and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. My favorite rock is ice. Uh, you may not have realized it, but ice is actually a rock. It fits the definition of a rock. A rock is an aggregate of minerals and a mineral is something that has a crystalline structure and was not man-made. And that fits the, it fits the, uh, fits the bill for ice. And so when you look at a glacier, and kind of, it's kind of a big rock that's moving around. So, one important point that I want to make is that glaciers move. They just move really slowly. If you look at this video I'm showing here, it's a little time lapse. This is a glacier over tens of years, looking at it from space, from a satellite that's looking down at it. And if you watch, you'll see that it's sort of flowing, right? Ice is moving from the bottom left to the upper right. It's, you're looking down at the surface and it's carrying material along with it. Some of that material is coming from the walls of the valley, uh, dropping stuff on top of the ice. It's being conveyor belted uh, down ice as the glacier moves. It carries all that material to the front and dumps it in these big piles here called moraines. And the material that makes up the moraines is constituted from two things. Stuff that falls on the top and stuff the glacier grinds up from the land it's sitting on and then is able to carry along with it to the end at which point the ice melts and all that debris, we call it, which is just sort of rocks and dirt, gets dumped into these big piles. So why does this glacier do this? Why does it move like this sort of slow motion river? Well, it does it for the same basic reason 
that a river moves is that there's actually some very gentle slope on the surface of it. And just like if you were standing on a hill on a skateboard, you would roll down the hill because gravity would pull you down the hill. That's the same thing that happens with a glacier. It just moves really, really slow. So if you were sitting out there and watching it, it might not look like it was moving, but if you were to sit there for a year and you took a picture every 10 minutes, you would be able to look through those and be like, oh yeah, in fact, it is moving. And that all of that stuff it's sitting on, all of that rocks are slowly being ground up and excavated and moved away. And it's this process of grinding up the rocks, of eroding the rocks, that gives rise to lots of the landforms that we see left behind. When they move, they erode. Uh, they primarily do that. They primarily grind the rocks up through two processes. One is called abrasion and one is called quarrying. And I just, I put this little asterisk here. Erode means grind up the rocks. They sit atop and then move the ground up material away from where they're at. And so we can just talk about these two different processes that are going on at the bottom of the glacier where it sits on the rocks, how it breaks up the rocks, and then we can show all these beautiful landforms that glaciers are able to produce through the combination of these two uh, different processes of abrasion and quarry. So one thing to realize is that if you were to drill a hole through the, an entire glacier and go look at the ice that's right at the bottom of it, right where it's sitting on top of what we call the bed or the, the rocks, that ice has a lot of dirt in it. It's not perfectly clear like the ice you'd get out of a lake or that you make in your freezer. It, it, incorporates all of this debris that it's ground up in other places. And so this picture here is an example of it. So this is actually a tunnel. Uh, there's a tunnel in Norway that the Norwegian government has drilled for about a mile under the bottom of a glacier. And then you can poke your, you can, you can poke up through a door and you can melt out a big opening with a giant hose and look at the bottom of a glacier. You can actually be underneath the glacier. And that's where this, I took this picture. And what you're seeing here is the ice right at the bottom of that glacier. This ice has essentially no debris in it. It's, it's kind of like the ice you get in your freezer. But this right here, that's actually ice, right? It's ice with like 10% dirt in it. It looks like more than 10%, but in reality, that's how much is in there. There's all sorts of little fragments of rocks in here and like smaller grains of dirt, you know, things that might be as big as your fist, something that might be as small as a grain of sand, or maybe even a boulder as big as a car. Glaciers can move all of it. And so when a glacier is, is moving and it's, it's what we call sliding down a hill, uh, this dirty ice is essentially moving over the bed that it's sitting on, right? And so you have um, the, the glacier grinding all of this material in this dirty ice against the bed. And that, that process is abrasion. It's kind of like sandpaper, right? If you have, this is a picture looking at it from the side. So the glacier would be very tall in this direction. Uh, here is right where the, it's called the ice bed interface, right where the glacier meets the bed. And here, are these little brown things just represent rocks that are in the ice. Those rocks are being pressed against the bed. And as the glacier slides, in this case, from left to right, it's just like sandpaper. If you took sandpaper and you rubbed it on a piece of wood, it would grind up the wood that it's sitting on. And it makes sawdust and things like that. If it was wood and the glacier does the same thing, it grinds up the rocks into these really, or grinds up the bedrock into these really small fragments, but then it's able to sort of move out of the way. Uh, that, in effect, slowly erodes the bed of the glacier and, and it actually, just like sandpaper, it sort of smooths things out. So here's a picture of uh, Lauren Adamo when she went to uh, Switzerland with me. And you can see these rocks are pretty smooth, right? These are rocks that were under the glacier as early as maybe 10 years before we took this picture. And when that happened, uh, the, the rocks were ground away by the, um, by the debris that was in the ice, smoothing it over time. So abrasion, the process of abrasion, smooths up the landscape, just like the process of uh, sandpaper will smooth off wood and make it smooth. It produces these linear features called striations, which you can think of the striation as just a scratch in the rock as an individual class or rock that was in the ice gets drug along the bed. And when you take it away, you're left with sort of a scratch mark in the bed. That's what the striation is. Here's another example of this uh, smoothing process. So the ice, again, this is a different glacier in Switzerland where the ice was sliding over the top. 
And you can see how smooth this texture is right here on this rock. And that's because of this abrasion process, smoothing the landforms over time and producing these striations in the rock here and here and here. Here's just a zoomed in picture of one of these striations. This is a, this is a what's called limestone. It's a darker rock, but it has this interesting feature that when you scratch it, the scratch uh, turns white. And so um, as the rock is moving, uh, as the ice is moving over this, and rocks like this might have been embedded in the base of ice, they're actually scratching away this limestone and leaving these white streaks or striations behind. They're just scratch marks. The other process by which glaciers erode is this thing called quarrying. Uh, quarrying occurs because of an interesting thing that happens at the bed of the glacier, which is as ice slides over the bed, it can form these things called cavities. Now think of the bed as something like this. It has a stair step pattern that looks like this on it. And if ice is sliding from left to right, it can actually kind of ramp off of this bed piece right here. And it can form this cavity behind it. And that cavity can be filled with water. But what does this mean? It means if you're at the bottom of a glacier and this cavity here is filled with water, all of the ice between here and here, all of the weight of that ice, which normally would be distributed over this whole part of the bed, gets concentrated on just this really small piece of the bed. And that fact that the weight gets concentrated on this smaller and smaller piece of the bed means that that part of the bed gets more and more stress on it. And eventually, the stress can be so high on this part of the bed that it can cause the rock to crack, right? And so an analogy is like this. If you're standing on the ground and you have two feet on the ground, all of your weight is distributed on your two feet, right? Now, if you pick up one foot, what happens? All of your, you still weigh the same. It's just all of your weight is distributed to just one foot. And so there's a, that, that foot has a lot more pressure on it. Now, if you were able to do this, Say you could pick up your whole body and all of your weight was just on one toe, sort of like a ballerina dancer or something like that. That toe has an incredible amount of stress on it. And in this instance, you could put so much stress on it that you could actually, uh, you could actually crack the, uh, the rock below it. Uh, I, I think everyone can hear me. Uh, Julie, can you hear me? I keep getting text messages coming across the yeah. setting. There's oh. a setting on WebEx that they have to enable in order to hear. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure I wasn't talking to the boy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, so all of that weight gets distributed over just this little part of the bed, whereas before it might have been over the whole thing, and that causes a crack to grow. And if this crack gets big enough, this section of the bed right here can just be called quarried away or plucked away, and the glacier can, can remove it. Um, and that's essentially this process of quarrying. Quarrying has the opposite effect of abrasion. It actually makes the beds of glaciers much rougher, right? If you were to look at a, a heavily quarried glacial bed, it would have all sorts of angular shapes to it. It'd be really rough. Whereas a, a, a glacial bed that had been heavily abraded would be relatively flat, right? It'd be everything would be smoothed out. So here's just an example of what some of these look like. So the ice would be sliding in this case from the top to the bottom. Uh, this is after, obviously, after the ice is, has melted back. But here's a block that was just quarried in the way I was saying, but it hasn't quite been sort of pulled away yet. So this process of these rocks cracking back here and then being pulled away, and then a little bit later, it would crack back here, and this block would be pulled away, and so on and so forth, until the whole bed sort of gets lowered a big chunk this much over time because of this quarrying process. Okay, so we have two main processes by which glaciers erode their beds. Quarrying, plucking away of these big blocks and abrasion like sandpaper, which sort of uh, slowly grinds the whole bed down. You put these th two things together and you get what is effectively the most powerful erosive process in all of the world, right? Glaciers are the most powerful eroding thing in the world. That's why when you go to glacial landscapes, they look so dramatic compared to things that were eroded by rivers or wind or something like that. It's, it's these two things that sort of have this immense ability to move a lot of rock or erode a lot of rock much more rapidly than other than other surface processes, other things acting at the surface of the earth that give us these dramatic landscapes that glaciers can make. Uh, okay, a couple of examples of this is one bad form where you can see that both abrasion and quarrying has happened. So the ice would be flowing from left to right over the top of this bullet looking thing. 
and the up eye side is all smooth. It has all these striations on it. And the down eye side over here is really angular and blocky. And that's because there's been a lot of quarrying over here. So the back side of this thing is dominated by quarrying. And the, and the front side of this thing is dominated by abrasion. And so you have smooth versus, versus sort of blocky or, or, or irregular. And so when you look at a landscape that's been eroded by uh, uh, a glacier, both of these things are happening. Sometimes one happens more than the other. Sometimes one landscape might favor quarrying to a higher uh, degree than abrasion. But other places, abrasion dominates and quarrying doesn't happen quite as fast. And that has to do with sort of properties of the rocks themselves. But it's sort of the balance of these two things that sort of set what the landscape will look like after the glacier is done with it. So this is a feature called a Roche Moutonnet. Uh, this is a picture I took in Yosemite National Park. If you've ever been there, up in something called the Tuolumne Meadows, there's a lot of these things up in New Hampshire, a little bit north of uh, where where a lot of you all are in, in um, Rutgers. And what you see here is this is a giant landform that was underneath the ice. The ice was flowing from right to left. The up ice side of this thing is smooth because it's had a lot of abrasion. And the back ice, the, back, the down ice or the back side of this thing is very steep and blocky because it's been dominated by that quarrying process. So this is just an example of one of these landforms, but on a huge scale. So to put it in perspective, you can see right here is a, a tree. There's people actually rock climbed up the back of these things. If you're me, you just walk up the front and then and then look down the cliff at them rock climbing up. But a lot of them will enjoy rock climbing, will climb at the back of this thing. And again, here's just a sort of a schematic of what I'm talking about. In this case, the ice is flowing from right to left, just like with that picture. You have lots of abrasion on the up ice side and quarrying on the down ice side. This name, Roche Motenay, is kind of interesting. It's it's a French word and it stands for uh goat wig. It has to do with these wigs that uh, that uh, French noblemen used to wear back in the day that had this really steep front side and sort of smooth back side that they would that they would put goat fat in the shape. And so it, it's got this sort of weird um, history associated with the name, or at least that's what's attributed to. Other types of landforms, probably the most famous landform that a glacial makes. And when I say landform, I just mean like a, a the way the glacier shaped the land, the, the shape, the form of the land is a, called a U shaped valley. So, if you look at a river and a river has cut a valley in a mountainside, the valley will have a V shape, right? There's a characteristic difference between a river that produces a V shape and a glacier, which produces a U shaped valley. The U shaped valley have very steep walls and sort of a flat bottom like this. And so, what you're seeing here is one of these U shaped valleys. So, you see these really steep walls here. The glacier in this case is actually still sitting in the valley and over time it sort of will grind its way down into this into this uh, valley getting deeper and deeper at some point in the distance past the glacier probably sat up higher like this and then over the under, over the hundreds of thousands of years it's been eroding this way it's just slowly ground its way down over time and, and formed this characteristic u-shaped valley if you go to yosemite national valley that's a u-shaped valley because the whole thing was carved out by a glacier uh ending about fifteen thousand years ago Here's another example of these U-shaped valleys. So you can see this, this uh, system here with this flat bottom, sort of steeper sides that look like this. And that's a characteristic feature, again, of, of glacial erosion in particular. Here's probably the most famous U-shaped valley. This is Yosemite National Park. Uh, you can see these very steep sidewalls here. Uh, that's because the glaciers sort of buzzsaw its way down. And you have this flat bottom to the valley floor. Uh, Rivers don't tend to do this. Like I said, they tend to make these gentler slopes. And so the, the, the combination of glacier producing quarrying and abrasion with this rapid erosion rate allows it to cut down into the earth very quickly and leave these very steep walls. Now that's fine, especially when the glacier's in here because this whole valley might be completely filled up with ice. But then after the glacier melts and you're left with this valley behind, now you have these very steep walls. Lots of times the materials from the wall well, actually have rock falls and landslides and fall into the valley themselves. Uh, and other times, um, it'll slowly fill at the bottom. So the bottom of this Yosemite Valley is pretty flat. And that's because at one point there was actually a giant lake in there. And the lake filled up with sediment over time 
and filled up the bottom of this U-shaped valley. So if you went and removed all of that lake sediment that was deposited after the glacier had left, had retreated from that area, uh, th this valley would actually be almost 2,000 feet deeper than what we see right now when we go there. A hanging valley is a specific type of U-shaped uh, valley where one U-shaped valley meets another U-shaped valley. And so here's a U-shaped valley that's higher up, and it's meeting this main U-shaped valley that runs through the, the uh, paper or through the slide this way. These are really uh, characteristic. Uh, sort of characteristic features because they often have these giant waterfalls that come out of them. In nature, a lot of the times it's hard to have this really big change in elevation over a over such a short distance because if that exists, if there's a large elevation difference between, for example, here and at the valley floor, the waterfalls will quickly erode it back to something that's not so steep. And so the fact that glacial landscapes have been sort of abandoned relatively recently in the geologic past still allows them to have these big elevation differences between what is the hanging valley, the, left, the, one, the one that's left hanging up here, and the main valley, which facilitates these large waterfalls coming out of them and sort of making these very scenic, picturesque um, environments. If you follow a glacier all the way up to its head, right where it's sort of born, at the highest highest elevations, at the highest spots, you find these landforms called cirques. And they look kind of like this. They're these bowl-shaped features. And again, just like the U-shaped valley, just like the roche Montney, these cirques are formed because the glacier is slowly abrading and quarrying its bedrock and eating uh, back into the rocks that are higher and higher up. At this point, it's ate all the way back to this point, and you're left with this sort of bowl depression. This is a lot of the uh, where you will find glaciers nowadays, and it's because these cirques, these bowls, are are very much in the shadows, right? And ice can exist a lot longer. It has less chance of melting if it's sort of residing in one of these shadowed areas. And so lots of glaciers might be almost completely gone, but there might be a little bit of ice left up in these cirque and these bowl features that they've sort of eroded over time. You tend to get something else called an over deepening, which is like a cirque. And then there's another bowl below it and another bowl below it over time. And so here we're looking in uh, Glacier National Park. We're up at a higher elevation and we're looking down a valley, a giant valley where a big glacier had gone. And you can see a couple of things here. You see there's a lake right here. And then there's no lake. And then there's a lake. And then there's no lake. And then there's a lake. And these, and these areas between the lakes are separated by these sort of what you call regals or a bar, right? And that bar is at slightly higher elevation than, for example, the lake that's behind it. So if you were to take all the water out of the lake, the bottom of this lake would be even deeper, right? And so there's this pattern where the glacier will dig a hole and then it'll go up a little bit. And then as it moves down, it'll dig a hole, go up, dig a hole, go up, dig a hole, go up. And that pattern of digging a hole and going up and digging a hole and going up and digging a hole and going up is an over deepening. And it, glaciers tend to do this along their valley profiles at the bottom. They make, they don't, unlike a river that tries to make sort of a completely smooth base over time, a glacier won't do that. It'll dig this irregular uh, topography into the bed as it's moving down because of the feedback of, of uh, quarrying and abrasion, and in particular, how water that's at the surface of the glacier might make its way down to the bed and affect those processes of coring and abrasion. And so it's very common to see these giant U-shaped valleys like you're seeing here that might be, you know, 10, 20 miles long with all these series of lakes in them as you move down because of this, uh, and because of the process of, of coring, and that's called an over-deepened valley or an over-deepened feature. Okay, so why should we care? One thing that's particularly important about this is this effectively regulates the heights of mountains, right? If mountains, if glaciers weren't there, mountains would get very, very tall. But what happens is a, as a mountain gets really tall, it starts to get colder and colder higher up in the atmosphere. If you've ever been up in a plane or gone to the top of a mountain, you know it's cold up there, and that's because the atmosphere is cold. The same thing happens as glaciers get tall, it gets colder and colder, which you're more likely to get a glacier, and then the glacier will erode the mountain down a little bit. And so there's this idea that what essentially regulates the maximum height of a lot of mountains around the world is 
the fact that uh, once they get too tall, they start to build glaciers and then the glaciers quickly erode them back down to a lower elevation. Uh, and like I said before, they're the most powerful mechanism of erosion on the surface of the earth, right? They quickly can erode through the earth uh, over time. And when I say the most powerful, you might ask, well, what does that mean? Well, it might not seem like a lot, but a glacier can erode about a half an inch a year, right? But over long times, that's a lot of material over time that's buzzing down. And that's that's probably uh, 10 times or 20 times faster than, for example, how quickly a river could cut down through, through uh, bedrock, for example. Also, they've essentially shaped most of uh, Central North America and off to the East Coast as well. And this is just, and this isn't even showing all the mountain glaciers that we have in Colorado and things like that in Washington. So this map, everywhere there's a color on here, there's actually material that, that is an area the glacier has advanced over and, and ground up this stuff and then deposited it back down. And the different colors just correspond to the different types of deposits that are there. And so you'll see a lot of the, for example, most fertile uh, farm grounds farmlands in, a, in, a, in America happen to be in the footprint of where these glaciers are. Because when abrasion and quarrying act together and they grind up the sediment, they make this perfect sort of distribution of sizes of small, medium, and large that when it's laid down, that plants really like to grow into it. So some of these areas like Iowa and Minnesota, they have really thick deposits of uh, the ground up material that the glacier then put back down, make very sort of fertile farm grounds. Well, you can see over on the East Coast, it sort of advanced down in New Jersey part of the way, sort of got halfway down into Pennsylvania. And this is just the last glacial advance called the Wisconsin Glacial Advance that sort of peaked about 25,000 years ago, at least in Wisconsin, it sort of varies from place to place. And so the landscapes that we see all around us are more or less directly shaped by glaciers that have sort of advanced over these areas, especially for those of us that live sort of, you know, in this north, northern, north, central, northeast part of the country. Okay, so what's next? It turns out that to measure these processes of glacial erosion is pretty hard, right? I said that it might erode a half an inch a year, but that's underneath the bottom of a glacier. So how do we figure that out? Well, one thing is to maybe go to like a uh, lab, like I showed uh, or showed that picture from in Norway, where there's a tunnel under the glacier, but that's that's few and far between. And when you go under there, it's hard to make sense of all the different things that are going on and competing against each other. Another thing is to build big sort of crazy machines like this, right? So this is a machine where you can put sort of a donut shape of ice on top of a rock and you can spin that donut shape ice and you can put sediment and sand in the ice and watch it grind up the rocks below it. And in a lab, you can really precisely control all of these types of features. And from that, we can really begin to figure out exactly how uh, abrasion and quarrying work on a mechanical sense so that we can make predictions on a bigger scale of like how they make you roach point nades, how they make you shave valleys, how they make over deepenings. But it starts with getting the small scale physics left uh, correct in, in a machine sort of like this. Uh, this is just a video of that machine. So this is sped up about 3000 times, but you'll see the top of this is moving. Oh, that's ice and on the bottom of it in this case is sediment. And you can do the same types of things to measure abrasion. And so this thing just sort of actually mimics all of the processes that are going on at the bottom of the glacier. And this is the type of stuff that uh, I work on to couple of these laboratory experiments with going into the field and looking at all these cool landforms to try to take the field and figure out what the, the physics, the math out of the sort of put the two together. Okay, so I think I'm right about on time here. Yeah. Uh, plenty of time for questions as they come up, and I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that I can answer them. Okay, I got a couple questions here. They're filling them up. Okay, here's a Deshaun would like to know if you can remind everyone of the definition of a glacier. Yeah. A def, a, all a glacier is, is a giant pile of ice that moves under its own weight, right? So, for example, if you had a giant pile of ice that wasn't moving under its own weight, say you took a lake and you froze it completely full so that it was uh, just a giant bowl of ice, it wouldn't flow, right? It wouldn't move down a hill because there's no hill to move down in that case. 
So that would not be a glacier. But if you took that, if you took a giant pile of ice and you froze it on the side of a mountain, and then you and then you let it sit there for a while, it will sort of ooze down the mountain, just like if you poured honey out on the side of a board and watch the honey slowly roll down the board. That's essentially what the glacier is doing, right? It's a combination of it, uh, the ice deforming, just like the honey would. And also the other way it moves is sort of like if you put an ice cube on a board and you tilted the board, the ice cube would slide down the board. So it's that sliding process that gives rise to lots of these erosion processes that I've just talked about and the sort of deformation that uh, has to, but to be technically a glacier, it has to be deforming. Um, have you ever found rare minerals, rocks in a glacier? And if you have, what mineral rocks? I've found uh, some really cool quartz crystals, huge ones that were out, that just sort of had come out from the front of the glacier. Uh, something you'd like you'd find in a rock shop. One, the coolest thing I ever found on, in a glacier was actually not a rock or a mineral. It was a glacier in Canada where the military had built an army base on the glacier uh, around the uh, early 30s to practice for um, sort of invasions during World War II. And then they had this left it and the base had become crushed. And then over the subsequent 70 years and the melting, the base had actually started to come back out of the glacier on the surface. And we found all these old coins that uh, had sort of popped up along with other material that had come out of the glacier. People in Canada, though, look in the those deposits at the ends of the glaciers, they're called moraines, and they dig around in them. And it's very common to find gold nuggets and um, chunks of copper and things in those. And then what they try to do is figure out where that glacier came from, because if they can figure out the direction the glacier was flowing, they can go back that way and try to find where those mineral deposits were uh, found. So you've probably heard like um, people look for diamonds in mines and there's a lot of, there's actually some Kimberlite pipes in Canada that are the source of some of these diamonds. And they're really hard to find because they're just sort of maybe like a mile across and very deep. But if we can find it, then you can, then you have a diamond. Mine. And so what people have done is go to the deposits from glaciers, look for those diamonds and try to go back to find those Kimberlite uh, Kimberlite pipe pipes. I've never found one, but people have done that. Uh, Melissa from Virginia would like to know how is glacial melting affecting the animals that live in the environment? Well, it it sort of is a double edged sword. A lot of glaciers, as they melt back, it actually exposes more land for like plants to grow on and animals to start to develop. But that land is not particularly good. For for plants and animals to grow on for a while, right? Because it's a very cold environment. There's lots of wind. There's all sorts of um, there's all sorts of other competing effects that sort of make it hard for an plant life initially and then animal life later to take over. So it it it, it occurs. It, it it just takes a while. Uh, in some areas, you'll have glaciers building these big lakes up in front of them that may flood out the terrains that uh, the animals will live in. So Overall, I would say it's sort of a mix. It's affecting them in a way by uh, creating more land that they could live on, but potentially taking away some resources they might have depended on, like, for example, water or something that was coming out of the glacier. Uh, Melissa would also like to know how many glaciers there are on the earth. Well, there's about 200,000 glaciers on the earth, and that is a weird uh, that, that counts them all equally, right? So it counts the glaciers in Antarctica that are you know, 10 times the size of the state of uh, New Jersey, the same as a glacier in Glacier National Park that may be the size of a football field or something, right? And so uh, most of the world's glaciers or most of the world's glacial ice is currently in Antarctica, but there's a large portion of it also in Greenland. And then there's a small percent, maybe 10, 5% that's sort of scattered around the whole rest of the world, mostly in, in mountains and things like, like those, but most of those are smaller in volume uh, even though they still count, you know, as one glacier here, one glacier there. Uh, Ania would like to know, would the melting glaciers harm us? They won't harm you directly, uh, but the one thing that they, the main problem they pose is that that water eventually will go into the sea. And that can cause the sea to start to go up with time. Right, and so if you live in a area that's right near the ocean, for example, and the ocean goes up a foot, 
then you would have to worry maybe about flooding, increased rates of flooding and things like that. And so most of the time, that's the, the large scale impact of glaciers. There are some sort of hazards associated with them. Like I said, sometimes glaciers can build uh, lakes out in front of them and those lakes will catastrophically uh, drain, right? And that's problematic if the if there's a town, for example, in the valley below or something like that, these big flood events can can be caused by the melting of the glacier, by the meltwater of the glacier being released very rapidly. Those aren't that common. And in places where that happens, it tends to happen again and again and again, like maybe every couple of years. And so people know that that's a possibility and they know not to live there. Uh, and so maybe that field will be used for like um, feeding animals or something like that. And they know every spring they got to get it off there because there's a chance it could drain. And so the uh, and so the occurrence of these things happening in new places that we haven't seen them before, that's pretty rare. They do happen a lot, but they tend to happen in places where we know they're going to happen, I guess is the way I would say it. Levi would like to know, what mummies have you found in the ice and where are they well preserved? I, unfortunately, have never found a mummy in the ice. Uh, people have found... Um, you know, sometimes people will find hikers and things like that that have fallen in a crevasse, you know, hundreds of years ago and slowly make their way up to the surface. But that's an extremely rare occurrence, especially in the places where I work a lot, which is like in Antarctica and Greenland. And that's because there's not really people uh, up on those glaciers that much. In the Alps and things like that, in, in Switzerland and France, there's a lot more people walking around in there. Most of the time, if, if you find anything coming out of the glacier that's that's sort of man-made or, or something to do with humans, it's in those more heavily populated regions where people are walking around the glacier for sort of entertainment and things like that. Uh, Lily would like to know, what happens if two big glaciers hit each other? That's a, that's a great question. As far as the landforms that were produced, that's actually how that hanging valley is formed. It's a big glacier and another glacier hitting each other. And the big glacier erodes a little faster than a small glacier. And so when they melt, you're left with one valley that's at a lower elevation and another valley that's at a higher elevation. And that's the hanging valley. What why that happens is because essentially the little the one glacier, if the if the, so let's say two glaciers hit each other, then all of their volume combines and the thing speeds up, right? It's like if you if you had a garden hose. And you piped two garden hoses into one garden, ho garden hose, and you're putting water through both of these. The water that then is coming through the other one has to go twice as fast to get all that water out of there. And so, a lot of the times when two glaciers run into each other, it results in the ice downstream of there, down ice of there, speeding up and going faster and faster. And it turns out abrasion and chlorine, those occur, they erode the bed faster and faster if the ice moves faster and faster. So, in areas where glaciers are going really quickly, they're going to erode the bed much more quickly. Lily would like to know. Oh, I just heard that. Deshaun would like to know what kinds of rocks are made from heat and pressure. Uh, there's okay. So igneous rocks are a type of rock made from heat and pressure. But the probably the uh, the bigger category is something called metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks, by definition, are other rocks that have had heat and or pressure applied to them, and then they change over time. So there's a type of rock called a schist or a gneiss. Those are metamorphic rocks, and they fall into this category of, by definition, being formed by uh, being altered because of the heat and the pressure that's applied to them. Grant would like to know, are there different kinds of glaciers? That's a really good question, and there are. Um, there's two main ways that glaciers are sort of classified. One is sometimes people will classify them based on their shape. So what do they look like just from above? How big are they? Um, are they, do they look like a dome, like a donut? Do they look like a line? Do they cover a whole continent like Antarctica? Uh, that's one way. The, in, in that classification, the biggest things are called ice sheets. That's like Antarctica and Greenland. Then there's a smaller thing called ice caps. Those are, it doesn't really matter, but they're landforms that are above 50,000 square kilometers. Those are a lot of the times in places like 
the Canadian Rockies. There's a lot of ice caps in Iceland. And then on a smaller scale yet, there's something called valley glaciers. And those are the types of glaciers I've been showing here that sort of sit in, in a valley with rocks on the side. Uh, and so those are, that's one way. The other way that you can uh, classify glaciers is actually based on their temperature. And so think about if I had an ice cube. That ice cube, the temperature of the ice could be at negative 10 Fahrenheit, right? It's fine. Like ice can get really cold. If I put it in water, say I took that same ice cube and I put it in a glass of water, what's going to happen? It's going to cool the water down, but that water is actually going to warm the ice cube up. And the water will get warm, or the ice cube will get warmer and warmer and warmer until it gets to the freezing point. And we're talking at Fahrenheit, that's 32 degrees. Something very important happens when the about how ice behaves once it gets right to that point, right to 32 degrees. And so all of the glaciers in the world that are moving very fast, and so therefore doing lots of erosion or contributing to the sea level, have at least the bottoms of them right at that point. They're right at 32 degrees because that, that ability for them to be at 32 degrees feeds into their uh, mechanism that allows them to move quickly. And so you can clear, you can classify them by essentially their temperature structure in addition to what they look like, right? The temperature structure is more useful this, for describing mechanically how they will behave and the in the in the shape and the form of them. It's just a good way to sort of classify. I'm talking about an ice sheet. Well, that must be huge. I'm talking about an ice cap. That's still really big. Or I'm talking about a valley glacier. Ah, it might be not that big, or it could be smaller. Uh, Alexander would like to know have there ever been something that has surprised you that you have found in a glacier? Uh, last summer, was it last summer? No, it was it was two summers ago. I was on a glacier in Canada, and I saw this something melting out of the ice, and I was like, "What in the heck is that?" <laughs> and I got closer, and I got closer to it, and it was a dead moose. It must have fallen in the glacier hundreds of years ago and been buried and the moose antlers and the moose were slowly coming out of the ice as the ice was melting around it over the course of a day. That's definitely the most surprising thing I've ever found coming out of a glacier. Uh, Tallulah would like to know how are glaciers formed? Good question, good question. So this is something I probably should have talked about. To get a glacier, there's a pretty simple recipe and that is that you keep adding snow over, over time quicker than you are able to melt away some of that snow. So imagine you, you were talking about a whole year and I put, uh, and I have a uh, area and I dump out 10, 10 five gallon buckets of, of snow. And then in the summer, uh, six five gallon buckets worth of snow melt away from that. What am I left with? I'm left with four uh, five gallon buckets of snow. If I keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that year after year, what happens? This huge pile of snow builds up. At the bottom of that pile of snow, there's a lot of snow above it. And that puts a lot of weight on that snow at the bottom. And that's just like if you've ever been in a snowball fight, you pick up snow, what's the first thing you do? You, you, you smush it with your hands to try to get it to be more compact and more solid. If you could push it hard enough, you'd actually turn that snow into ice, just compressing it. And so after time, if you build a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger pile of snow, the bottom of it actually gets pressed into ice. And so if the climate is cold enough for a long enough period of time, or you get to just get enough snow for a long enough period of time, you start to build up this huge pile of ice with a sort of a lens of, or a layer of snow on top of it. And once that ice gets thick enough, it turns out to be about uh, 100 to 300 feet that's when it can start to flow, like I was talking before. Before that, it just kind of uh, it's kind of stiff, like a like a uh, a block of wood or something. But after it gets more than a hundred meters thick or three hundred feet thick, that's when it starts to move down a hill like honey would, and that's when you start to get a glacier, right? And so it's this buildup of snow year after year after year that gets compressed at the bottom into ice, and then as the ice gets big enough. If it's on a slope, it'll start to move down the slope, and that's that's how you get a glacier. Um, Deshaun would like to know, does obsidian form when you put lava and water on each other? Obsidian is igneous rock. Uh, it occurs in, it's sort of a natural glass looking thing. 
there's an interesting situation where uh, in Iceland, right? I don't know if, if you don't know about Iceland, Iceland has lots of giant volcanoes on it. A volcano is kind of like a mountain, right? So it means at the tops of these things, it's particularly cold. And so you build up a big glacier, huge ice caps on tops of giant volcanoes in Iceland. But every once in a while, those, those uh, volcanoes erupt. That does a couple of interesting things. One is it can melt a bunch of water immediately. And to answer a question from earlier, that can cause a lot of meltwater to leave. And, and sometimes it knocks out all the roads in Iceland, knocks out the sheep, all these crazy things. But the other thing is the lava coming up and then being in direct contact with the ice causes the, causes the lava to cool very quickly. And you'd get a, this really interesting kind of obsidian that forms in, uh, in those types of environments. And so areas where you have actually have volcanoes sitting, or sorry, glaciers sitting on top of volcanoes, you get this rare kind of obsidian, uh, and you can make these really weird shape, you can make whole mountains out of the things because of the weird way they cool down, <laughs> essentially. Well, Tallulah would like to know, are there ways glaciers help us? What's your favorite thing about glaciers? Glaciers are, are extremely helpful, right? If you live in India, most of your drinking water would come from glaciers up in the Himalayan mountains that melt. The water then flows down, and it comes through. Um, it comes. It comes through rivers and streams like the Ganges that people get most of their drinking water. Same for South America and Bolivia and things like that. Most of their drinking water, a lot of their fresh drinking water, comes from glaciers that are melting. And so, what can happen is. They're this great reservoir because maybe in the middle of the summer in these places is particularly dry and you don't get a lot of rainfall. It's very hard to get water, but if it's, if it's dry and it's hot, the glaciers are going to melt and it's going to supply the water. And so a lot of these places that are dependent on glaciers for their drinking water uh, are going to, could be severely affected if the glaciers went away because they would no longer have access to that drinking water <clears throat> through the, um, through the, the summer season to water the crops and things like that. Um, there's the second part of the question here. What is your favorite thing about glaciers? My my favorite thing about glaciers is is actually just trying to go around the landscape and figure out how the glaciers made it, right? So I live in Wisconsin where basically everything I see is shaped by a glacier. And I grew up in Michigan where literally everything I saw was basically made by a glacier. And so if I wanted to walk outside and say, why is this hill there? Or why is this thing there? It was because of a glacier. But you had to kind of piss uh, put the pieces of the puzzle together to figure out why it made this specific hill here. What is that? You know, and it, it's it's uh, my background is lar largely in like physics and math and stuff like that. But I really enjoy just walking around in the landscape and trying to play a detective and say, why is this thing here? Why why did the glacier make this landform here? And what can that tell us about it? You know, and and so whenever I go back home to visit my family they kind of probably get annoyed because I just sit there and look at maps of the area for a long time and drive around and look at all this random stuff. There's a lot of really, you know, there's a lot of interesting things right where I grew up that I didn't appreciate when I was, when I was living there as a kid. It was only later once I sort of started to connect with uh, the geologic surveys and like the other people in the area that knew a lot about it that they brought, um, could shed some light on the way that's going. That's why things like the Records Geology Museum are so great because they sort of allow uh, people in the community to know, you know, what what's what's here, why is it there, you know, what can you sort of learn from it. And so that that's my favorite thing about glaciers. Uh, um, Lily and Sean would like to know: Has anyone died from glaciers? Has anyone died on any of your journeys? No one's ever died on any of my journeys. People have died on glaciers. Um, the number one risk is if you're on a glacier. There's these features called crevasses, which are basically giant cracks in the ice. And so they can go down like 100 feet, right? And they're not very, they're, they're really literally cracks, right? Where they go down hundreds of feet, but across the top, the opening might only be 10 feet across. Because the, the top is so narrow, a lot of the times what happens is a snow bridge will form up there, right? And so snow will actually span the whole crack. And you'll be walking on the surface and you won't know that that crevasse is there, right? And people will step onto the snow bridge 
in the in the snow bridge is not strong enough to hold their weight and they'll fall down into the crevasse and get stuck. Uh, and, and sometimes people can't get out, right? And so to alleviate that, what people do is when they walk around on a glacier, you you walk around roped up. You especially walk around you especially go roped up if you're walking on a glacier where there's snow because the snow hides the crevasses. It's actually safer if there's no snow because then you can you can see them. You can say, ah, there's a crevasse right there. I don't want to step right there. But if there's snow, you can't see them. And so you walk roped up. So that if someone falls in, the ro the other person that has the, the rope connected to them can, can stop them and then pull them back out of the hole. You also walk around with these big, long, skinny poles that you poke in the ground in front of you as you're walking. It's almost like if you've ever been ice fishing, you sort of smash the ice with this thing called a spud. And if it goes through, the ice is too thin. With these things, you poke this the snow with these probes. And if they go in, Without you having to push too much resistance, you know you're on a snow bridge, so you better get back away from that. Uh, let's see. Oh, let go. Mary from Scotch Plains would like to know: Do all glaciers have crevasses, and are the crevasses along the whole length of the glacier? Per Basically, all glaciers have crevasses, but they're not along the whole length of the glacier. So sometimes. You can find crevasses in one area. You typically know where you're going to find them. And it has to do with, it, it's kind of like the question I got before, what happens when two glaciers meet each other? Will they speed up? Well, what happens is if, if one side is, if this is a glacier, I'm looking at it from the top, and this side is going faster than this side, this motion of it, this side outpacing the other side of the glacier, that rips the glacier open, and it rips open these crevasses. And so in areas where, you say this part of the glacier is going a lot faster than the area right next to it. That's a recipe for being having crevasses, and that normally happens in specific areas, like where glaciers meet, or where the glacier goes over some weird big bump at the bed, like those in the over deepening the regals I was talking about when it went down and then up and then down and then up. When it goes up and then starts to go back down again, that's a recipe for the ice pulling away from itself and making crevasses on the surface. Uh, how deep can a crevasse be? There's kind of a maximum limit, and it's about a uh, it's about a hundred meters or three hundred feet. So so extreme, you know, that that's a to put it in perspective. That's a, a thirty story building, right? <clears throat> and so they can be very very deep in some instances. Not all of them are that deep. Most of them are not that deep, but that is sort of uh, an upper limit. Oh wow, there's a whole other page of questions. Great, Nathan would like to know how many miles. Do you think you've walked while exploring? I've probably walked uh, hundreds of miles, hundred miles, but I've actually driven uh, a snowmobile almost all the way across Antarctica <laughs> at a very slow rate, and so that's why we have to be cognizant of the if there's crevasses or not because we're covering such huge spans. So I drove from basically the the coast of Ant the the center of Antarctica to the coast on a snowmobile at about seven miles an hour, which took an incredibly long time and is incredibly boring because Antarctica, while it seems ex uh, exotic and it is, most of it is it you would be hard pressed to tell the difference between it and being on a frozen lake because it's just everything is completely flat and white and. It screws with your mind because you lose depth perception and all these weird things. But that's basically the that's the farthest I've traveled on uh, either a snowmobile or on foot. I've flown all over Antarctica on these little planes, so that's a little bit different. Uh, Tolula would like to know: Have you ever found a crystal? Yep, not in the glacier, but I found the crystal in this glacier called Rhone Glacier. I was actually there with Lauren. And she actually broke her foot while she was walking over there with me. Uh, so she didn't get to go up to the point where we found the crystals. We found all oh, this whole vein of, of these giant quartz crystals coming out. This is it's the best crystal deposit I've ever found anywhere in my entire life as a geologist. And it was just I was just taking as many of them as I could because they were so cool. And then I got home and basically that's what I gave all my family as as gifts. And I don't, they probably don't they're tired of getting rocks from me, but those were the coolest rocks I ever found. So they were going to get those ones. John wants to know besides the moose, have you ever found any other animals in the ice? I've never found animals in the ice i found a skeleton of like a, a sort of a mountain goat that was on the area right after the ice pulled back 
So a lot of the times there's not many animals that live up there. There's these things, there's mountain goats and there's, if you're in some like Europe, there's these things called Ibex, which are basically this really, really awesome kind of goat. That's about it. You know, there's not lots of bears or anything else up there because there's nothing to eat. There's no food for them to eat. And so you, the animals have to be extremely hardy to be up there. Uh, Melissa would like to know, are new glaciers forming on Earth? And if so, where? For the most part, no. The one exception is sometimes after a volcano blows up, like Mount St. Helens in Washington, it leaves this crater. Remember how I said a cirque is a good place to form a glacier because it's always in the shadow? Well, the crater of a volcano turns to be a pretty good place to form a, a, a glacier for the same thing. And so, um, and so after Mount St. Helen blew up and everything cooled down, a glacier actually started to start to grow in in the caldera, which is the which is the sort of the part that goes down in in, in the in the glacier because of that. And so m most of the world's glaciers are retreating. They're melting faster. They're melting more snow than being pulled in them. Some of them are advancing, uh, but those are not new glaciers. Uh, and in very, very rare instances, like in Mount St. Helens, where there's some uh, sort of bizarre circumstance, uh, there's a new glacier, but there's, there's probably in the whole world, maybe like five, right, new glaciers. Can glacial water be contaminated and unsafe to drink? It can, especially if there's animals around. The main problem with glacial water is that that process of abrasion makes this really fine grain material, super fine grain, meaning that you can't even, it's, it's called silt. It's basically like what you can think of in mud. And so the water that comes out of the glacier almost always has that mud in it. And if you don't filter that out by like pouring the water through some sort of a piece of cloth or something, and you drink that mud, it can give you all sorts of stomach problems, essentially. And so you have to filter it out. That's the biggest problem with glacial water is not actually like diseases, per se, like you would get from like a, a sheep or something like that, because most of the time there's not many around, but it's the mud that's in the water from the glacial operation process. Lily would like to know if you have a favorite glacier. <laughs> uh, I do have a favorite glacier. It's called Saskatchewan Glacier, and it's in Banff National Park. If you go to Banff National Park, there's two, there's, the, there's a very famous glacier called Athabasca, which you can drive almost up to, that there's lots of tourists on. There's a one next to it that's a lot bigger called Saskatchewan Glacier that if you're up for a walk of about three or four miles, you can go back to and it's amazing. It's where we've been going the past couple summers uh, and it's just it's just unbelievably beautiful. Uh, Lily and Tallulah would like to know what's the biggest glacier you've ever seen? The biggest glacier I've ever seen is, is this glacier in Antarctica called Thwaites Glacier. It's the most important glacier in the world. Uh, and that's because the way it's situated, if it were to collapse, meaning uh, very quickly uh, disintegrate, it could cause most of the West Antarctic ice sheet to collapse with it. And so that's why we've been there. That's why we've been going there because it's so important. It's, it's uh, probably 600 miles long and probably 150 miles across. So it's huge. It's named after a glacial geologist from the University of Wisconsin Madison, this guy uh, Fred Thwaites, and so I have his I have his picture hanging outside of my office because I'm sort of his replacements, replacements, replacements. He, he he was active like in the 1930s. That's the biggest glacier I've ever seen. It's so big that you can't even tell it's a glacier when you're on it. It just looks like you know, it looks like if you're on a on Lake Michigan and Lake Michigan. It's bigger than Lake Michigan, but if you're on Lake Michigan, the whole Lake Michigan was just frozen solid and it was just flat. Okay, I think this is the last one. Tallulah would like to know, has someone ever made a house on a glacier? If so, does that work? No one's made a house on a glacier because, because the glacier's flowing. If you put a house on it, it would be like if you built a house on a foundation and the foundation was constantly shifting and it would break the whole house apart. The closest is that army base that I was talking about, which was kind of like a Lincoln log style log cabin, which allowed it to flex a little bit, but even that was sort of destroyed after a couple of years. So I think we're at one o'clock now. I think Rita, Rita wants to sort of wrap it up and then I'll turn it over to her. Thank you so much. That was really great. Um, and 
Thank you to everyone who was listening today. So since we're out of time, we're sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, but you guys had really awesome questions and I think Luke did a great job answering all of them. So thanks once again, thanks to Luke and thanks to the audience. And um, stay tuned for our next Ask a Geologist that will be on Friday, April 2nd at 1 p.m. We will have Dr. Robert Mayer, who is a professor at the University of Puerto Rico at Aguadilla. And he's going to talk about restoring sand dunes. So stay tuned for that. That's on April 2nd. And thanks once again, Luke, and have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody.